Welcome back to Constitution Alive with David Barton and Rick Green. In our first chapter, we kind of laid the foundation, talked about our purpose and approach and why it's important to study the Constitution. Now we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the, the secret sauce. Really, we're going to find out what that formula is that made the American experiment so successful. So David, why are we not going to start with the Constitution? Why don't we back up a decade to the Declaration? We, go, we have to go to the Declaration because it's a document that set forth the principles. So the Constitution said, you remember those principles we, we gave you 11 years ago? Well, here's, here's the way we want them applied. So the Constitution's application of the principles, you have to go back to the principles. In the first session we talked about kind of like baseball training camp, kind of like yeah. basketball camp. You go back and you get the basics right. And that's what the Constitution did is went back to those principles. Now there's a real interesting movement that has been going for three to four decades in America and that is to separate the Declaration from the Constitution. Oh, we take enough to uphold the Constitution, not the Declaration. Oh, did those documents say, I remember one of the guys we worked with and got elected to Congress uh, actually took out the Chairman Judiciary Committee. We have a letter from Chairman Judiciary Committee saying, no, no, the, doc, the Declaration is absolutely irrelevant in American I wonder why they don't. Is it because it mentions God? Is it because, well, it I mentions mean, God the... a lot, but it's, see, the, the thing is, if you ignore the principles, you can take and do anything you want with That's the word. That's true. You can change. You can change. You it. lose the intent. You, you lose can take the foundation. That, we talked in the first that you can take that screwdriver and make it into a shovel. Right. If right. I get rid of the owner's manual, if I get rid of the principles, then I can use this any way I want to. And so there is a movement to do that. Now, there, there's four reasons, real simple reasons, that people need to know of why you do not separate the Declaration from the Constitution. You're going to talk about this in, in Independence Hall. And, and why we have to study the Declaration to even understand the Constitution You cannot correctly. understand it. You, yeah. you, will, you can never properly interpret and understand the, because the, the key is knowing what they were trying to do. Yeah. Because that's, that's what you said. Well, they were trying to do certain things. Who cares if we've got cars and Internet? This, it's what they were trying to do in jurisdictional. So when you look at the Declaration of the Constitution, there, there's four reasons they can't be separated. The first is constitutional acts. The Constitution itself dates itself to the year of our independence. It does not date itself to what they did in 1787. That's not when they started numbering. The Constitution says we have done this Constitution in the 11th year of our independence. So, at the, so they saw that as the beginning. They, they saw, saw that the, the Declaration as the beginning See, and, and therefore part and, of it. And that's what we still do to this day. The current president, when he signs a presidential act, now these are early presidential acts. This one happens to be from, from John Quincy Adams. Hold that one. This is an actual, That's an actual presidential act signed by John there. Quincy John Adams. John Quincy Adams. Wow. Here is one. This one is one with James Madison. This is, you know, James Madison up here, signature down here. What's That's delicate. I can see why you didn't let me take this to Independence By the way, <laughs> a, a little bit of trivia on this. Um, your great-grandparents probably talked about getting their sheepskin when they graduated from college. Yeah. And that was their diploma, and that's because it was sheepskin. This is vellum. So this, this is animal oh, really? skin. So the, the old days, when you got a diploma, when you got a certificate, it was literally animal skin. Wow. So this is sheepskin. But here, here's what you see. It's, a seat, it's signed there by the president, James Madison. But what you need to see is, given under my hand the city of Washington, this Constitutional Act, the 19th day of June, and the year of our Lord, which is the way the Constitution closes. So anybody who says it's secular, then what do you do with that? The year of our Lord. That's the Constitutional close. 1,813, and of the independence of the United States of America, in the 37th year. So it's counting it's all the way back. It's a constitutional act that dates it back. It, it dates itself back to. It's, look at the one you got. So that's so 1813, and then they back up 37 years, and, and, and that's going to take us 1776. So, so mine's second of March in the year of our Lord one 1820. I think that says six, doesn't it? It looks it was 27. Oh, 27. Okay, and the independence of the United States of America. I can't read it. It's 50 something. But the point right. is, it does point go is back it's to going back to it goes back it's to not independence. to it the goes Constitution back to itself. Right. So if we, if we, okay, so that's one good reason, just the Constitution itself. What's the next one? The second good reason is the way that states became part of the United States. You had to have an enabling act. So when we had the original 13 colonies, we also had territories, Southern Territory, the Ohio Territory, the Northwest Territory. If you want to become a state in the United States, you have to, you have to follow the provisions set up by Congress in an enabling act. So enabling acts we had through what was called the Northwest Ordinance that said, all right, you get 40,000 people in your territory, you set up a territorial form of government, you have to have a Republican form of government, here's what you do, judiciary, education, et cetera. And those are the requirements. If you fulfill that, then you can become a state in the United States on application to Congress and Congress accepting that. It's interesting that the enabling acts for the states, whether you're Colorado, whether you're Nebraska, whether you're Nevada, wherever, it said you can't become a state in the United States unless you follow the principles of the Declaration and the wording of the Constitution. So to become a state, the two documents were joined together. Saying we don't want you part of our nation as a state unless you principles of the Declaration, you get those the principles wording of the Constitution. 
Wow. So that's the second reason. The third reason we point to is the U.S. Code's organic laws. Now, the U.S. Code annotated is what lists all the laws of the United States with all the decisions on by courts telling you how they're currently interpreted. And on page one of the current federal code, and, and we know from the Supremacy Clause that federal law trumps state law, st trumps state constitutions, et cetera. So the Supremacy Clause puts federal law at the top, up with the Constitution. And in this U.S. Code, which is federal laws, on page one, it lists four organic laws of the United States, and those are the four laws that no other law can be allowed to violate. And one of those is the Declaration of Independence. So the Constitution and Declaration are two of the four organic laws. You cannot pass laws that violate the Declaration. So even our federal code recognizes that. And the fourth reason is fairly simple, grievance corollaries. And this is what you alluded to earlier. If you don't understand what the Declaration is trying to do, you don't understand what the Constitution did. Yeah. Because so many clauses in the Constitution came direct. They, they said in the Declaration, look, here's 27 reasons we're leaving Great Britain. Because they've got 27 things wrong. Well, 11 years later, when we get a chance to fix them, we do fix them. And so, they here, don't want to happen again. We don't want to yeah, happen again. Don't so repeat, here's, so. here's a simple one. You, you, you take, and if you want to know what Article 1, Section 5, Clause 4 in the Constitution means, you need to read Grievance Number 4 in the Declaration. So let's do that. This is, so the, we're literally taking them we're, together. We're, we're taking, taking them the together. two documents together. So okay. we're, we're going to take the two together. So Grievance Number 4 in the Declaration says, he, the king, King George III, has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatigue them into compliance of his measures. We had Congress that says, state, state legislators said, we're not doing what the king wants. He says, okay, you're not going to meet in Williamsburg anymore. You're going to meet out in the boonies He's out here. He's just trying to make it difficult That's and right. keep them from meeting. All meeting. your government documents are there in Williamsburg as a Virginian, but we're going to have you meet out in the boonies. Now let's see you get the documents. Let's see you refer to the laws. And, and so he, and it was for the purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with the measures. So we don't want that happening in the Congress, so that's why in the Constitution we're specifically told, neither house during the session of Congress shall, without the consent of the other, adjourned for more than three days, nor to any other place than that in which the two houses shall be sitting. You can't send us somewhere else, and it specifically gives that as a, as a corollary. Same thing if you want to know what Article 1, Section 4, Paragraph 1 and 2 means, you've got to go back and read Grievances 5 and 6. Grievances 5 and 6, again, we're talking about King George III and the British. It says he's dissolved representative houses repeatedly. So he, he didn't like what they were doing. He would just wipe them out, as he did in Massachusetts. You, you're, you're out of session. Your session just ended by my order for opposing with manly firmness his invasion on the rights of the people. And that's what Massachusetts legislators are doing, standing for North Carolina, et cetera. Yeah. He has refused for a long time after such, so he wipes out the legislators, and then for a long time, he's refused to cause others to be elected. He wants us to let us have new elections. Basically taking away our right to a representative government. That's yeah. right. Whereby the legislative powers, which are incapable of annihilation, in other words, legislative powers are supposed to be there. Government is ordained by God. You're supposed to have those powers. They've been returned to the people at large for their exercise, the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. We've lost our ability to have civil government. We're now in anarchy. Setting us up for easy invasion, easy Because easy nobody make can make decisions or protect yeah. us. Well. So Constitution says specifically, the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof, but the Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations except as to the place of choosing senators. The Congress shall assemble at least once in every year, and such meetings shall be on the first Monday in December, unless they shall by law appoint a different day. Quite frankly, you can't wipe out Congress and tell us we can't meet for years. We're going to make sure we get together once every year. In other words, you're not going to be able to dissolve us. Yeah. We've got to be together, and we are going to get together at least once a year, so you can't wipe us out for five years and tell us don't come. Constitution took care of that grievance. It's, it sets up the playbook. It sets up, here's the parameters. That's here's exactly how things right. are going to happen. You can't change That's this because right. we don't want this to be willy-nilly to whatever the king wants. That's right. This has got to be set in stone. And two, two more quick examples. Okay. Article 1, Section 8, uh, Paragraph 4, Clause 4. If you want to know what that means, you read Grievance 7 in the Declaration. Grievance sec 7 in the Declaration says, He, the king, has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose, obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migration so that he wants our numbers as small as he can get them. And he won't let us grow, and he's not letting us have immigration. By the way, immigration for a long time, including through the early presidents, was a state issue, not a federal issue. Interesting. States are the ones who set immigration laws. And so you're not immigrating in the United States. You're immigrating. You're going to live in Virginia. You're going to live in North Carolina. You're going to live in Georgia. So the states are the ones who set the immigration laws originally yeah. under the Constitution. So he said, what's happened is we're trying to get more people in our states to populate, and he won't let us do that. And so the Constitution says, ah, they we'll fix it. this. The Congress shall have power to establish a uniform rule of naturalization. 
You're not going to be able to shut down immigration. You, you can't shut it down. And here's the fourth and final example. Uh, if you want to understand Article 1, Section 8, Clause 9, you have to read Grievance Number 8. And it says, he's obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. Now, this is one of, there's four grievances in the Declaration where the Founding Fathers are complaining about what he was doing judiciary. And they specifically said, he doesn't let the judges be accountable to people. He's given them lifetime appointments. He's running the judges, not us. And so he's obstructed our administration of justice. He wiped out for a while jury trials, et cetera. John Adams went through the roof when they didn't have jury trials. Mm. But the, the, the British were taking judges to make policy. They were taking judges to keep the Americans pushed down. So what we did was, is, well, we're not letting that happen. Congress will have power to constitute tribunals and period of the Supreme Court. Congress is the one who takes care of judges. Congress is the one. We're not going to have the king tell them, having judges tell us what to do. We're going to have Congress over yeah. the judges. So it, you cannot understand the Constitution without the Declaration, and, and that's because of Constitution itself dates itself back there. Uh, the Enabling Act, you can't be part of the United States if you don't follow both documents. Our current federal code says you have to follow both documents. And you just don't understand the Constitution without the Declaration. Yeah. So there's you no way to separate the two. You've got to put them together. you got to study both That's of them. That's the framework for it. That's yeah. the framework. All right, well, let's dive into that framework. We're going to get into some of those seeds of liberty. And let's go back to the place where those seeds bore fruit. We're headed to Independence Hall. Welcome back to the Constitutional Live. We're now going to talk about the seeds of liberty, what the ideas were that these guys actually sowed into our nation and how, how it created such a successful nation. And remember that what John Jay told us, our secret uh, formula for how we're going to study the Constitution, he said to make sure that you not only read, but study the Constitution. So if we're going to study it, we've got to get inside the minds of these guys. We've got to know what that original intent, if that's going to be our focus, is original intent, we've got to go back to what these guys actually put in place. I always think it's important not just to study the Constitution, but to study the Declaration with the Constitution. In fact, the founder said you really had to do that. I, I like the way John Quincy Adams put it. In my language, he said that it was the slab that the home of the Constitution was built upon, the Declaration was. But here's the way he said it. The Declaration of Independence was the platform upon which the Constitution of the United States had been erected. The principles proclaimed in the Declaration of Independence were embodied in the Constitution of the United States. I like the analogy to a business. If you've uh, ever incorporated a business, you got your articles of incorporation, you got your, your bylaws. Well, your articles of incorporation kind of tell the world this is what we are, this is who we are, this is what we're about. And then the bylaws are the rules by which that company is going to operate. In this room, they gave us our articles of incorporation in the Declaration of Independence, the philosophy of America. It said, here's who we are, what we're about, and what we're going to do. And then the Constitution, that's our bylaws. That's the rules by which our nation operates. That's the rules of our nation. So we like to take them together. And I, I find it interesting that when you look at them side by side, you find a lot of the grievances in the Declaration of Independence actually solved in the Constitution. Grievances that, that they said, we're separating from the mother country over this, and we want to make sure that our nation never does the same thing. Now, of course, if you, if you grew up like I did on, on Saturday morning watching Schoolhouse Rocks, <laughs> anybody else watching? Okay, I'm the only one in the room. Anyway, Schoolhouse, you know, I'm a Bill, the little guy. Well, in Schoolhouse Rocks, what's the one reason why we declared our independence from Great Britain? What's the one everybody always talks about? Taxation without representation, right? That's the one we all know. 27 reasons. That was like number 17. It's way down on the list. You had religious liberty issues. You had judicial tyranny issues. A lot of things that we're going to raise later tonight. But all of these grievances in the Declaration, so many of them are mentioned in the Constitution. So let's start with the Declaration. And let's go back again to this room and these guys in this room. And actually, let's, let's back up about a month before what we talked about earlier. On June 7th, 1776, Richard Henry Lee, right over here from Virginia, stands up and he makes the motion. He says that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. And that's treason. He just committed treason right here in Independence Hall. He committed treason against the mother country. John Adams seconds the motion. The guy taking the journal scratches out both their names because he knows that's the two guys King George is going after right off the bat. They debate it. They talk about it for several days. They talk about what they, should they even consider this? If they do consider it, how should they go about doing it? Talk, talk, talk. Finally, those five guys you see in the middle of the screen, those were the five guys that were given the responsibility for drafting the Declaration of Independence. And immediately you probably recognize Jefferson and Franklin. Uh, Franklin's on the right of Jefferson there, and to the far left is Adams. Two guys in the middle there, that's Roger Sherman and Robert Livingston. Livingston actually ended up not getting to sign. Here, he's the guy, the chairman actually, of the committee to write the Declaration, but he gets called away and doesn't get a chance 
uh, to sign. But anyway, so these guys come back with a declaration. As you know, Jefferson did all the heavy lifting. In fact, right around the corner, they've rebuilt his, his apartment there, and they put all these original furnishings back in. It's incredible. You can go in and see the, 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 the place where he wrote the Declaration of Independence. You can see the things that he wrote it with. It's just phenomenal. But so he, he drafts it, brings it back in. They debate it here for several days, and they're debating and debating. Finally, one of the guys has had all he can handle. I mean, he's just tired of the talk. He wants some action. He's not a well-known founding father. I think he sat over in this corner over here. His name was Larry. And Larry got up and he said, guys, it's time to get her done. <laughs> I'm waiting for a ranger to tackle me for saying that because that, that did not happen. Okay, it wasn't, it wasn't Larry. It was actually John Witherspoon. And it was, it was Witherspoon from New Jersey right here saying, you know, it was kind of a 1776 version of Get Her Done because John Dickens in it actually said, the people are not ripe for revolution. So Witherspoon gets up and he says, they're not only ripe, but rotting. He said, let's take the vote. They took the vote. The vote failed. He actually had three states that said no initially. South Carolina, Delaware, and Pennsylvania all said no. Now, Delaware was close, man. Delaware was a tie. Delaware was a one-to-one -one tie, and the third delegate, Caesar Rodney, wasn't here. He had been called back home a Brigadier General, and, and instantly Thomas McKean, the yes vote, he knows, man, if Rodney was here, we could get independence. But if Rodney doesn't get back by the time we take the vote again, independence is going to fail. So he sends a dispatch back to Delaware, tells him, find Caesar Rodney, tell Rodney to get back here. We've got to have him or independence fails. Rodney gets the message, gets on his horse, takes off, rides all night long. Now, this is 80 miles, right? 80 miles from Delaware back. Now, 80 miles, I know for us that doesn't sound like much, right? I mean, I mean today, 80 miles is... You know, if, if my wife's driving, that's 30 minutes or so. That's just not going to take that long. But, 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 but back then, 80 miles on horseback at night, Rodney had cancer of the face. He's hidden branches. It's a painful experience. Rodney gets here, busts through those doors just in time to cast the tie-breaking vote for Delaware. Delaware goes from being a 1-1 tie to being 2-1 to one for independence. And in fact, Caesar Rodney's pen, the actual quill that he used is sitting right there on that desk. That's the pen that he used to sign the Declaration of Independence. Well, you say, okay, fine, Rick, that's Rodney. That takes care of Delaware. And by the way, if you, I don't know if you collect the, the quarters from each state, but if you get the one from Delaware, on the back of that quarter, they chose to put Caesar Rodney. Why? Because of his midnight ride to save independence. So that takes care of Delaware. What about Pennsylvania? Well, Pennsylvania had, had initially been four of them against independence, three of them for independence. So that means that we lose. This happens in politics all the time. When the opposition is not in the room, take the vote, man. Get the vote done before they get back. Well, that's kind of what happened. Two of your guys against independence, they either left. We don't know for sure if they left or they just said, we're staying silent and decided not to vote. But Pennsylvania went from being four to three against independence to being three to two for independence. South Carolina completely flipped their entire vote. And there you have it. That's how close we were to not getting our independence. I, I don't know about you. I'm not a a huge fan of the HBO special on John Adams. I loved the first two episodes, but later I just felt like they, they portrayed him as just, I don't know, just kind of like a sourpuss, really. I mean, he's always jealous of Washington. He doesn't care about his kids. They never talked about his faith. I mean, I just didn't like the way they ended up uh, uh, portraying it later on. But in those first two episodes, when they portrayed what happened in here, they really captured it, I think. They, they, they captured how, how close these guys were, and you saw kind of the wrangling back and forth and the negotiating and, the, and trying to convince each other of what to do. And it did, it did show, I think, accurately that, that John Adams was really the force behind the whole thing. I mean, without him, we would have never had independence. But we were very close not to having independence. And, and not only was independence itself really miraculous in the way that things came together, but the Revolutionary War itself, throughout the war, you know, Washington and others talked about how the wind came up at just the right time, the fog came in at just the right time, over and over and over again, they said divine providence intervened on behalf of the Americans. So they brought to life the words of the Declaration, they, they, they managed to free a nation, and then George Mason gave us sort of a challenge. And, and Mason, of course, was in here for the Constitution. He, he was one of the 55 that framed the Constitution, not one of the 39 to sign. And I bet somebody in this room can tell me, what, what was his objection once they finished the Constitution? Why did he say, I'm not signing? Help me out. Yes, that's exactly right. The Bill of Rights. No Bill of Rights. He wanted those guarantees, those individual protections. There's actually three of the guys that refused to sign for that very reason. And he actually is known today as the father of the Bill of Rights. So, so Mason, though, he gave us a great warning. So here he is, champion of the, of the Bill of Rights. He, he gave us a great warning about our freedoms that these guys put in place. He said, no free government nor the blessings of liberty can be preserved to any people but by a frequent recurrence to fundamental principles. Now, now to me, that means you can't just learn it once, 
you've got to constantly come back and remind yourself what are the principles that made us, made us great. And so that's, again, what we're doing. We're going back to these founding documents for that frequent recurrence to those principles. What were the ideas these guys put in place? I call the Declaration of Independence, or at least the first two paragraphs, the frame of America. In, 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 in my mind, in my way of thinking, those were the principles. If you go to that heart of the Declaration, you'll find the frame for our picture. And you might have a different picture that you would throw up on the screen here, but if you could picture freedom, if you could take some picture of your family or your, 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 your schools or your community or your churches, whatever it might be, and put that picture inside the frame of America, know this. If that frame goes, then your picture's going with it. My picture's going with it. That, that frame is what's holding it all together. Th those principles they put in place, that's why we're free. And if we lose that frame, if we allow that frame to be destroyed or transformed or changed into something that they didn't give us, then we're going to lose the picture. And we're going to have a very different America than we were given. So it's important for us to remember the frame and remember what the principles are in the Declaration of Independence. And, and I, I'm going to actually ask for a little bit of help here tonight. I'm going to get uh, one of my sons to come up and share with us those principles out of the Declaration of Independence. He's going to share with you the first two paragraphs, and then he's going to describe what those precious 56 words in the second paragraph, what they really mean and what they gave us in America. So y'all help me welcome Rhett Green. He's going to come up and join us. Come on up, buddy. Come on in. He's even more nervous about crossing this rail than I was. So, All right, Rhett, let's come right back here. There's your spot. Now, you're, you are standing in the very spot where the guys that wrote the language that you're about to share with us, where they debated it, where they came up with it, where they adopted it. So this is a pretty historic occasion. I want you to share the, the first paragraph where Jefferson actually is telling us, hey, here's why we're going to tell the whole world what we're doing, and then the 56 words, and then give us a little description of those 56 words. Go ahead, buddy. One of the course of human events becomes necessary for one people to resolve the political band which I connected them to another to assume the powers of the earth, a separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitles them. A disrespected opinion of mankind acquires that they should clear the causes that impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain and able rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men driving their just power to the consent of the governed. In the words of the Declaration, there are four basic principles that make up the frame of America. First, the Founding Fathers began with the basic idea that truth is real, it is obvious, and it does not change. Second, they made it clear that God is a source of freedom. Like the Declaration says, our eyes don't come from any elected or appointed officials, they come from God Almighty. Third, the just powers of government can only come from the consent of the governed. That's you and me. The word consent is used three times in the Declaration and 11 times in the Constitution. Obviously, our founding fathers didn't want the government's use of power without our consent. They wanted us to always remember the government's use of power without our consent is tyranny. Now, last part of the frame is the pursuit of happiness. This is the free enterprise system that made America the most successful nation in history. Thomas Jefferson once said, a wise and frugal government that shall lead men free to regulate their own pursuit and industry improvement and shall not take from the mouth of labor bread it has earned, this is a sum of good government. Now, let's all do our part to preserve those four principles. Welcome back, my dad. Good job, buddy. Way to go. Come on, you take that with you. <laughs> All right, our, our nine-year-old scholar on the Declaration of Independence. We've got to do something about these shy, poorly socialized homeschoolers, I guess. I don't know. Uh, anyway, okay, so I'm just going to touch on one quick thing about each of those things that, that, uh, that uh, Rhett was just sharing with you because... Uh, you know, I mean, I think it's obvious sometimes when we say it today, truths, that we forget what these guys were comparing that to around the world. In other words, when we say truths today, we mean obviously moral absolutes, a, a right and wrong, that there is a right and wrong. It's always right to do right. It's always wrong to do wrong. 
Put yourself back in, in their shoes and in, in their day and what those words meant. For instance, George Washington put it this way. He said, of all the habits and dispositions which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. So, so he's saying that if you're going to have a formula that works, if you're going to have a nation that's successful, of all the pieces of that formula that you put in there, you've got to have religion and morality. And without those two, it's just not going to work. And a lot of my friends are always saying, well, Rick, man, I'm into liberty. You know, I, I'm into freedom, but don't mention God. You know, don't, don't, don't bring the Bible into this. Don't do anything. You know, they, they don't want any of that. They say, hey, I can be a patriot without that. And I say, well, yeah, that's probably true, but, but George Washington would have disagreed. Washington actually said, in vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism that would work to subvert or labor to su subvert these great pillars. What pillars? Religion and morality. Why is he saying that? Because when he's given that speech, he's watching the French Revolution take place. So, so see, the American Revolution was, was based on the idea of right and wrong and, and, and freedom or liberty under God, liberty with God. The, the French Revolution was the opposite. The French Revolution was liberty without God. It, it was all about everybody do whatever's right in their own eyes. It's just two different philosophies. Theirs led to chaos. It led to the guillotine. It, it, it led to destruction. Ours led to the greatest nation in the history of the world. So there was something special about our formula. And Washington was saying, you can't have liberty without morality. You can't have morality without religion. You've got to keep those things in who you are, that, that God's at the center of our equation of freedom. So as we work to preserve freedom, or as some today say, like Jefferson, you know that you need a good revolution. In our situation, we just need a freedom revolution. We just need more actions by our citizens, just participating, voting, being a part of the process. We don't have to revolt with bullets. We get to revolt with ballots. What a wonderful system. These guys laid their lives on the line, so we wouldn't have to do it that way. So we want revolution. Yes, no question about it. Constantly having a revolution of freedom in our nation. Here's the deal, though. We don't want the French kind, okay? <laughs> so we don't want to try freedom without God. We want to make sure it's freedom, recognizing there's something bigger than us, that I'm not the end-all, be-all. You're not the end-all, be-all. Uh, I mentioned on the break, my, my friend Zig Ziglar. Zig told me one time, he said, Rick, I know three things. I know there is a God. I know I'm not Him, and neither are you. <laughs> Thought I was getting a little too big for my britches, I guess. But, but so we need to remember that, right? We need to re remember that we're not the end-all, be-all. And, and that's, I think, what these guys were saying. It wasn't that you had to worship the same way I do or, or, or be of the same faith that I was, but it was a recognition that there is a creator in this equation of freedom. And that's why I think Jefferson had those important words in the Declaration, that we are, in fact, endowed by our creator, not by our commissioner or our president or our government, but we're endowed by our creator. And that was a distinction, really. I think, I think what Jefferson was trying to say there was, hey, we're not going to be like Europe. Every, every, or anywhere else on the planet. Because if you were, were, again, back in their shoes, if you went back to their day, when these guys came in this room in 1776 and, and adopted this declaration, every model of government around the planet was different from what they were putting forth. Every model of government in, on the whole planet looked kind of like this. It said that power and freedom comes from God, but it goes to the king, it goes to the, to the monarch, and then the monarch decides how much freedom we the people get. So, so everything in our life really depended upon our relationship to the king. If you didn't have a good relationship, you didn't have much at all. These guys in this room did something nobody had ever done. They, they flipped that on its head. They totally turned that around, and they said, no, 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 we believe freedom comes from God, no doubt. That's the source of our rights and our source of freedom. But we believe that that freedom from God goes directly to the people. And then we, the people, we give power to government only as we see fit, just like Rhett was saying consent of the governed. The only just powers of government come from the consent of the governed. So what, what Jefferson and these guys put in place was a system that says there's freedom granted by God, there's rights granted, and it goes directly to us, and then we give power to government only for one reason, to protect and secure the freedom that God gave us. So that creates a totally different, different atmosphere because if these guys didn't give us our freedom, if government didn't give us our freedom, government can't take it away. If your neighbor is not the one that gave you freedom, then your neighbor can't take it away. See, I love the fact that these guys said there's equal protection for all because it comes from a higher source. And if we take that piece of the puzzle out of the equation, we have no true freedom. We've got to keep that piece in. So let's not forget that. And let's make sure that it's liberty under God, not liberty without God. And that didn't change with the Constitution. I mean, that was the philosophy behind the Declaration for sure. But even when they came in and did the Constitution itself, could you imagine the things these guys were fighting about? I mean, 
They pretty much gave up about five weeks into this thing. And here they were debating over, okay, we throw the Articles of Confederation out, we start over, how are we going to sell that to the American people? Uh, big state versus small state, back and forth, back and forth. Oh, finally, people start coming with their plans. They can't seem to find a plan they really agree on. Slavery and the Three-Fifths Compromise, they fought about that for a while. And, and, and I always thought when I read that, that a Three-Fifths Compromise, that, that the Three-Fifths Compromise language was, was devaluing a human being. That, that, that was saying that person was only worth three-fifths of a person. And then I read this guy, Frederick Douglass. I don't know if you've read much of Frederick Douglass. Great abolitionist. Amazing guy. I mean, you talk about somebody that God used in a mighty way. I mean, incredible guy. Read Frederick Douglass. And Douglass said he thought the same thing. He said, that's devaluing me as a, as a black man. He said, I don't like that. And then he went and he read the debates that took place right here in this room. And he said, when I read those debates, I figured out, no, that was actually the northern states punishing the southern states and saying, hey, if you're going to keep slavery... We're going to decrease your representation in Congress. You're not going to get as many members of Congress as long as you've got slavery. Now, once you get rid of slavery and you free everybody, you let everybody vote, you let everybody participate, you let everybody have freedom, you'll get the same amount of representation in Congress that we have. That's what that was all about. But, man, they went back and forth, talked about property and what it meant. And you really had some, some strong anti-slavery guys in here trying to end slavery from the beginning. Obviously, we didn't accomplish that, and it took 100 years and a lot of bloodshed to get it right. But a lot of these guys were on the right side of that argument from day one. So anyway, you had all these fights going on. You get about five weeks in and people started leaving. They just started giving up. Say, it's just not going to happen. We're not going to reach an agreement. And some people started leaving. And so this man right here gets up to save the day. Benjamin Franklin, who sat right here by where I'm talking, the, the sage, the, 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 the wise man of the convention. He was 81. 81 when he sat there during those constitutional debates. And I, I have trouble even wrapping my head around that. I mean, I used to think 81 was old. I don't, I don't think that anymore. It's getting younger and younger. Um, in fact, I was with a congressman doing an event a while back, and he had just turned 81. He, he was my congressman when I was growing up. I mean, when I went to high school, he was, he was my congressman. He's still in Congress, so he's been there a little while. Um, but he had just turned 81 before this event that we were doing, just a week or two before. And so he gets up there to introduce me after he does his thing, and he says, Rick, he said, I bet you think 81's old. He said, let me tell you something. I just turned 81 last week. And he said, I went to Senator Strom Thurmond's 100-year birthday party. He said, at that party, Thurmond looked over at me and said, oh, to be 80 again. <laughs> so so I, think, I think 81 today is still young. Don't, wouldn't you agree with that? All right, so 81 today is young. Not for these guys, all right? Average lifespan in their day and time was 35. This guy's 81. He's the elder statesman and probably the most respected guy here. I mean, when he spoke, everybody was going to listen. So he decides he's going to try to... Save the day. He's going to try to keep this thing going, keep these guys together. Stands up, gives his longest speech of the convention. It's June 28th is when this happens. So June 28th, 1787, right here, he stands up and he says, Mr. President, the small progress we've made after four or five weeks, close attendance and continual reasons with each other, our different sentiments on almost every question is me thinks a melancholy proof of the imperfection of the human understanding. Now, look, I'm, I'm a country boy, I'll just tell you, from Dripping Springs, Texas, and, and I have to try to make this stuff work for country boy language. I think what he just said is, we ain't smart enough. <laughs> he said, we don't have the brain power to solve these huge problems of our day. He's saying even with this brain trust in this room, some of the greatest minds on the planet, we cannot do this on our own is what he was saying. And so then he goes on to explain what they had been debating about. He said, we indeed seem to feel our own want of political wisdom since we've been running about in search of it. We've gone back to ancient times, to models of government, and examined those different forms of those republics which now no longer exist. They even looked at Europe. But look at the response when they looked at Europe. I love this. He said, we, we've viewed uh, modern states all around Europe, but find none of their constitutions suitable to our circumstances. Hmm, I just wish our leaders in Washington would still look to Europe and go, no, nah, that doesn't work for us. You know, there, there was a lot of wisdom in this room when they looked at Europe and said, we don't want to be like them, right? We want to be our, our own. Anyway, so he goes on to say, in this situation of this assembly, groping as it were in the dark to find political truth and scarce able to distinguish it when presented to us, how has it happened, sir, that we have not hitherto once thought of humbly applying to the Father of lights to illuminate our understanding? So Benjamin Franklin stands up and says to these guys after five weeks of debate, hey, time out. We're trying to solve the biggest problems in the world, and we haven't yet gone to God and said, would you please help us out? We can't do this on our own. And so then he gives them a history lesson. And, you know, I, I think it's interesting that 
Only 11 years into being a nation, we needed a history lesson already. I, I don't know about you. Now, most of you probably loved it. I hated history when I was in high school and college. I had no interest in what happened 200 years ago. You know, I just, you know, I was a kid. I didn't, I, I'm kind of a type A person. My wife says I'm type triple A. I mean, I tend to go 100 miles an hour. So I'm thinking about tomorrow, the next year, 100 years from now. I didn't want to think about yesterday. And, and then I, I got into law school and I started reading the opinions of these judges. And I realized these judges were really into history because the way that they perceived yesterday determined the decision they made in their, in their, in their uh, decisions in the court. And so then I got into the legislature and all my colleagues in the legislature, I realized and it finally became apparent how we each viewed yesterday determined our decisions today and therefore where our state was going in the future. Of course, I, I also find it interesting in the good book, God says, Remember the former days. He talks about studying our history. How many times throughout the Word of God does there constantly a reminder of here's what I was doing here and here's what happened here? Constantly looking at history. So I think it is important for us to study history, and that's why I love being here now. And I've fallen in love with history because of how much it influences where we're going. But I just it's hard for me to imagine these guys were all there. I mean, they knew what had happened in the Revolutionary War, and yet even though they were there and part of it, Benjamin Franklin had to stand up and give him a history lesson 11 years after what took place in this room for the Declaration. Here's how he put it. He said, in the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayer in this room for divine protection. So Franklin says to his colleagues, hey, remember in this room? See, he was one of six that signed both the Declaration and the Constitution, kind of like James Wilson, who we talked about earlier. A bunch of these guys weren't there for the Declaration, so he's really reminding them. I think he was speaking to them, and he was saying, hey, you may not have been in here, let me tell you something. We knew we couldn't do it on our own. So he said, in the beginning, so he takes them back to this room 11 years previous. He said, our prayers were heard and they were graciously answered. All of us engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of a superintending providence in our favor. Then he asked the same question from right here that I think we need to ask today. He said, have we now forgotten this powerful friend? Do we imagine we no longer need his assistance? I think that's kind of where we are in America. Do we really think we can solve these massive problems we're making, uh, that we're dealing with just on our own? Do we think we can do it on our own? Franklin said no more than 200 years ago. I would say no today. So he goes on to say, I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. You've heard this part of a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice. Is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? So here we are, they're talking about can a nation rise? Can they, can they take a constitution and create a successful nation? He's saying it can't happen without God. He's saying you can't do it without God. He said, um, we've been assured in the sacred writings that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. Then he said something real interesting. He said, I beg Mood to leave that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and his blessing on our deliberation be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business. Now, now why would this guy that, and I would argue out of all the guys, probably the least religious of our founding fathers. In fact, I think, you know, whether you come from a conservative, liberal point of view on the founding fathers, most everybody agrees. Ben Franklin was one of our least religious founding fathers. But, but least has got to be a relative term because here this least religious founding father if you're familiar with the Bible at all, you just heard him quote about 11 different scriptures right there in that one short quote. And he's saying, hey, we can't, you shouldn't even be trying to do this without God on our side. So here this guy is calling everybody saying, hey, we've got to keep God in the equation. God's an essential part of the equation. And Washington later would write and talk about the fact that he ended up leading everybody here to church. And they went to the church service and the pastor there actually preached on the, and talked about and prayed about the fact that what was happening in this room, God needed to move so that they could reach their compromises, get the Constitution out so that we could become that beacon on a hill. And Washington said the attitude really changed when they came back from that and, and they were able to work through things. And then once they worked through things, several of these guys looked back on those moments in this room and they said they believed the hand of God had played a role in what happened in here. Here's Franklin later. He said, I beg, I may not be understood to infer that our general convention was divinely inspired when it formed the new federal constitution, yet I must own, I have so much faith in the general government of the world by providence that I can hardly conceive a transaction of such momentous importance should be suffered to pass without being influenced, guided, and governed by that omnipotent, omnipresent, and beneficent ruler in whom all inferior spirits live and move and have their being. So he's quoting out of Acts right there to describe what he believed happened. James Madison, father of our Constitution, he said, the real wonder is that the Constitutional Convention overcame so many difficulties, and to overcome them with so much agreement was as unprecedented as it was unexpected. It is impossible for the pious man not to recognize in it a finger of that almighty hand which was so frequently extended to us in the critical stages of the Revolution. 
So, so they all remembered how throughout the revolution they saw God move and give them the, I mean, think about it. They were taking on the greatest military on the planet. We were about to rabble rouse. So there was no way we could win if there hadn't been some miraculous thing happens. And he's saying, just like we saw it in the revolution, we saw it in the Constitutional Convention. Couldn't have happened without God's hand. Alexander Hamilton, same kind of thing. He said, for my own part, I sincerely esteem the Constitution, a system which without the finger of God never could have been suggested and agreed upon by such a diversity of interests. And last, the man that sat in that very chair, right there, president of the convention, George Washington, father of our country. He said, as to my sentiments with respect to the new Constitution, it appears to me little short of a miracle. It demonstrates as visibly the finger of providence as any possible event in the course of human affairs can ever designate it. It was miraculous, folks. I mean, the fact that these, these concepts that had never been put together in a, govern, in a governing body, a, a, a republic never created like what they put together, you're saying it never would have happened if God hadn't inspired, if he hadn't made it happen. So I, I just want to lay that out first before we actually crack open the Constitution itself and get into the words to recognize where these guys got their ideas, where they gave credit to, in fact, who they quoted the most. Have you ever really kind of looked closely at what these guys were saying? They were students of history. Man, they quoted some of the great minds throughout our history. And I think it's important for us to know those influences. If you haven't read uh, uh, the, uh, Montesquieu and Spirit of the Laws and, 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 and John Locke and his two treatises of governments, all that is kind of the, the background, the, the big instruction manual, if you will, for this quick start guide. And so they quoted those guys quite a bit. And, and, and there was a, uh, a guy in, uh, in Houston, Texas, University of Houston, uh, na last name of Lutz, that did a study on their quotes, on, on who they quoted most often. And, and he took about 15,000 or so writings, I forget the number, and he, and he, and he charted them all, and he, and, he, and, he, and he put them in a spreadsheet, and he figured out, okay, who did these guys quote the most? And Montesquieu actually ranked number one. He, he was quoted 8.3% of the time by these guys. So almost, you know, what is that, almost 10%, I mean, almost one out of 10 times. They're quoting Montesquieu, but Blackstone was a close second. And they quoted Blackstone quite a bit. He was at 7.9%. Locke, I mentioned, uh, now, now Locke was probably more influential on the Declaration than on the Constitution, but still very influential. Was it 2. Nine, I can't see. Yeah, 2.9%. In fact, I, I, while we're talking about Locke, I thought it was interesting that Richard Henry Lee over there from Virginia, when he, uh, when he, quote, when he talked about the Declaration of Independence, he said that Jefferson basically copied the Declaration of Independence from Locke's two treatises of government. Now, now that two treatises of government, my copy is a 1764 version. It's about, I think mine's, it's either 404 or 406 pages. That's not a lot, right? I mean, roughly 400 pages. And in those roughly 400 pages, there's about 1,500 references to the Bible, quoting scripture on what government ought to look like. Now, you do the math. That's about three to four times on every page that John Locke is quoting the Bible, and that's the book that Jefferson copied the Declaration, according to Richard Henry Lee, who was, who was in this room. Now, you, you'll also find phrase after phrase in the Declaration of Independence uh, that, it, that was originally preached by a guy named John Wise. If you ever get a chance to read some of John Wise's sermons, these guys actually reprinted his sermons and put them out for publication because they were like the seeds of liberty. There was so much in there that when sown, man, people would, they would get excited about freedom and they would want to be uh, patriots and want to, want to be part of the revolution. So guys like that were big influence. But here's the, the most influential source on all these guys in the room. I bet you can guess what it was. It was the Bible. 34% of the time. Man, that's, I mean, that's one out of three. They're quoting the Bible. So a lot of people say the Bible didn't have any influence on the Constitution. I would disagree completely. If you read these guys, who they quoted, the phrases in the Constitution, they, they traced back to the Constitution, I mean, to the Bible. I mean, it's just over and over and over again. So, so the idea, uh, uh, just in, in summary, of truths out of the Declaration, the Creator being the source of our freedom, those were important concepts from the philosophy laid down in the Declaration before they even came to the Constitution itself. And the last thing I'll comment on what uh, Red had said about the pursuit of happiness, just give you a quick example on this whole free enterprise thing for America, why these guys knew that the pursuit of happiness was important, why free enterprise was a bedrock principle of our way of life. You've got to remember, as students of history, they were looking back to how things first started here on this continent. And you might remember Bradford tried socialism in the beginning with the pilgrims. And, and actually, it didn't work out so well. Now, it was, it was socialism. I mean, Karl Marx would have loved this. The way they did it was they said, everybody's going to work. Whatever you work for and the food you grow, you're going to put it in the public storehouse, and then everybody gets to take from it as they need it. Oh, and we'll all love each other, and we'll hold hands and sing Kumbaya. And it, and it sounded great, right? 
But what happened? Bradford said it was terrible. It didn't work at all. He said, you know, guys like me, I'd have been over there saying, hey, why should I work? I get all the food I want. I'm going to play golf. I mean, I don't think they play golf back then, but whatever you do in, in the, with the Pilgrims, I'm going to go play some games. Anyway, so he, he said, Bradford actually said people started faking being sick. They were actually faking illness. They, 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 were, they were not working and they were complaining. The ones that were working complained and said, hey, man, Green's over there not working. I'm feeding his family. Why didn't he? So here's what he said. He said, community of property was found to breed much confusion and discontent. So what was his solution? What did Bradford implement that we actually, these guys here said was so important? Free enterprise and private property. Imagine that. He said, okay, everybody, you get, you get your own property. You can grow stuff on that property, and then you can eat it, or you can sell it. You can do whatever you want with it. It's totally up to you. And within two years, those guys were exporting corn instead of starving to death. Free enterprise, private property, it worked, and these guys knew it. Here's how Bradford described it afterwards. He said, it made all hands very industrious, so that much more corn was planted than otherwise would have been by any means the governor or any other could devise, and saved him a great deal of trouble and gave far better satisfaction. So in other words, that system worked, and these guys knew that, and that's why they put it into our system in the pursuit of happiness. Now, here's where we come in. We are the governed, right? So it requires our consent for our system to work. If we want just power in our government, then we've got to give our consent. I like uh, uh, James Garfield. President Garfield was a, a, a pastor and also president of the United States, and he put it this way. He said, now more than ever before, the people are responsible for the character of their Congress. He said, if that body be ignorant, reckless, and corrupt. Don't be hollering out any congressman's name, okay? If that body be ignorant, reckless, and corrupt. I know we all pictured somebody, but... <laughs> If it be ignorant, reckless, and corrupt, it's because the people tolerate ignorance, recklessness, and corruption. He said, if it be intelligent, brave, and pure, it's because the people, I like this word, demand these high qualities to represent them in the national legislature. If the next centennial does not find us a great nation, it'll be because the people who represent the enterprise, the culture, and the morality of the nation. That's us. That's the people in this room now, the people at home watching, the people watching on the DVD. We are the enterprise, the culture, and the morality of the nation. He said, if we don't have a great nation, it's because those people did not aid in controlling the political forces. Now, controlling there simply means giving or refusing our consent, exercising our freedoms, living out the Constitution and the Declaration. Last quote on this. One of the guys in this room, John Francis Mercer, he actually told us that this document right here is not enough. That, that what they were framing would not be enough to guarantee freedom. In fact, he said it's a great mistake to suppose the paper we are to propose will govern the United States. He said the Constitution will not govern the United States. He said, wait a minute, I thought we came here to study the Constitution because it's governing the United States. He said, no, it's the men whom it will bring into the government. See, it's going to set up the rules for how we choose our leaders and how they're supposed to govern. So it does set up the rules, but it's not going to govern us. It's the men whom it will bring into the government and the interest they have in maintaining it that will govern them the paper will only mark out the mode and the form, kind of like that frame, men of the substance and must do the business. What he's saying is this document's great, but if we the people put people in office and on the bench that are willing to ignore it, willing to shred it, willing to distort it, willing to govern around it, it just doesn't mean anything anymore. The document doesn't govern us. The people we put into government is what governs us. So if we want to uphold this document, then we have to make wise decisions in choosing our leaders, we have to be part of the process even as it goes on, even after you choose the leaders, being engaged in our government, watching what's happening, letting our voice be heard constantly, just like these guys did in their lifetime. So that's, that's the philosophy that they gave us. There is a God. There, there are truths. There's right and wrong worth fighting for, worth dying for. Our system of government will work if we'll just be willing to give or, or refuse that consent. Being engaged will make those seeds of liberty spring forth. They'll give us a great nation of freedom. So now that we know the seeds of liberty, now that we know how we're going to do this, we're going to dive into the Constitution itself. When we come back in our next section, we're going to do kind of a, a 30,000 feet view, if you will. We're going to step back and look at the entire Constitution all at once, and then we'll start zooming into specific areas that are most under attack or most in question today. Sort of like our, our quick start guide, we're going to look for those places we need to be plugging things in and making sure that they work. So when we come back, we'll talk about that 30,000 feet view. Establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare.
Well, I guess you could tell Rhett was having as much fun as uh, as you and I have. Well, so we were you in the background right. watching Rhett. So you right. had a lot of fun too. We love teaching those principles from that very room. Now, before we get to the the thirty thousand feet. And by view, the way. I think that was the third thing, was to teach the rising generation. I think that's the third objective. There you go, getting those course. little guys teach in the there. That generation. is the rising generation. So in our next chapter, we'll, we'll get the 30,000 feet view on the Constitution itself. But before we do that, some more on these seeds of liberty. Yeah. Rhett was doing a little bit. He did four principles yeah. out of the Declaration. You go further in a, in a couple of other paragraphs there and yeah. broaden it out to six principles. Yeah, Rhett's got some really good application, like the free market systems they showed there. there there's so many good things there. Um, let's go back and, and back up just the overview of the, of the Declaration because it's National Birth Certificate, but there's 155 words up top that set forth six immutable principles. Okay. Those six principles are followed by 27 grievances and then the Declaration that because of these principles, the violation of them in 27 different categories, we're now going to become a separate nation. So when you look at those principles, let's just take clauses out of those 155 words because this is the essence, this is the key. By the way, this is what you've working on with other states uh, with the Celebrate uh, Celebrate Freedom Celebrate Week, yeah, Freedom sure. Week is to get them to learn these kind of principles. So yeah. what you've got They'll just is get into the founding documents. Get into the founding documents, real principles. simple stuff. Yeah. So you have the clause in the Declaration that says, all men are created equal, they're endowed by their creator. Now, what does that tell us is our first principle, that there is a divine creator? Now, right. today we're told, well, you can believe that, but not everybody believes in the creator, so that's why government can't take a position favoring religion over non-religion. That's what the courts have told us for these 40 years of judicial activism. Yeah. Uh, wait a minute. That document, it says that it's the unanimous declaration of 13 states of America. That doesn't sound like private individuals talking. This is the unanimous declaration of all the elected officials from those 13 states sent to the Continental Congress and later on. This is on, what we agreed on, right? Th this, I mean, this is what brought us together. This, this is, is our philosophy. public declaration yeah. to the world of why we're doing what we're doing. Why we're doing what we do because we in America believe there is a divine creator and that becomes the first step in limited government. You cannot have a limited government if you think the government's at the top of the, the pecking order. Yeah. If government's at the top, then what limits it? There's got to be something higher than government. If there's nothing higher than so we said, hey, there's a creator that's higher than everything. And that's why government is limited. It doesn't get to do it's not the creator. It doesn't get to do everything the creator does. It's below the creator. Yeah. So our thing is, all right, we're we believe there's a creator. We've been created. And the creator gets the right to tell his creation what to do. So government, listen up. And that so one principle has a huge impact on what kind of nation impact. you're gonna be. It's a huge yeah. impact. Uh, you you find me any secular government in the world that's a limited government, can't do it. It's an oxymoron. You cannot find it. France, Greece, maybe China. No, you can't go to Cuba. Uh, can't do Sweden. Can't do Norway. Uh, can't do Chile. Can't, you can't find a secular if, if government. If God's not in the equation, government has to be even bigger. Government is even God. More con that's, yeah, that's a great, great that way to it. put it. Yeah. There, there will be a supreme authority, and if it's not God, it will be government. Yeah. So if you, if you don't get the declaration concept right that God's at the top, then government thinks it's at the top, and therefore, when it gives you a right, it can regulate that right, it can repeal that right, it can take it away. If God's at the top, if God gives you a right, government, you keep your stinking hands off that because it doesn't belong to you, it belongs to God. It's a jurisdictional issue. Good. So that's the first point. The okay. second point is based on that. It says they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. So number one, not only is there a creator, he gives us a certain set of rights. These aren't given by government. They come from the creator. Therefore, government, these don't belong to you. It's, you know, you and I both live in Texas. I, I'm a cowboy, got the ranch, got all the stuff, and I got the pickup that goes with it. And I got <laughs> But a, no cowboy hat worn here today. Not on this. Not, not here. Very but often on the ranch. That's times. right. Yeah. I like my pickup. I got a red Ford pickup. And I've looked over at yours, and you got a gray Dodge. I don't like gray. <laughs> I'm going to go over and paint your pickup red because I like red pickup. I can't do that. Yeah. I don't have the jurisdictional authority to go over into something that doesn't belong to me and change it. And that's what we do with government. Say, hey, government, these rights over here. They come from God. They don't belong to you. You didn't give them. They come from God. Therefore, you cannot go over there and mess with them. Same way I can't go mess with your pickup. I may not like a Dodge, may not like gray. Doesn't matter. I don't have the authority to do anything. To that changes up. everything it when changes you really everything. think about the authority. Because a nation without God, that government has the authority to do anything they want. Because, like you said, they're God. You choose any other nation in the world that is secular. And, and you know, in Germany right now, they literally. It's a crime to homeschool your kids because you're not you're not the one over your in America. We've held for generations a position Supreme Court articulated in, in a case called Pierce versus Society of Sisters, Mine, Nebraska, that it's the fundamental right of parents to direct the education, upbringing, and care not of their the children. State. It's the not parent. the state. 
But over there, no, 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 parents, you belong to the state, the kids. In Scotland, we were talking to a guy recently who said in Scotland, from the time you're born, every kid is assigned a government official liaison oh, to the I state. I remember that on our radio That's show. Right. Yeah, I started thinking about it. Imagine that. If every kid's assigned they somebody assume the that state every kid belongs to the state. Them. That's right. Yeah. Every kid belongs to the state. Therefore, we have to assign you a government mm. official. The time, you're born, time you come to this earth, you don't belong to your parents. Wait a minute, we believe you do. We believe that the parents are the Lord because God made the parents. So the these initial principles really matter in they your in your day to day make, life. They it's not just huge. books and you know old documents. This this impacts and, our and lives. And it's not today. just well, if you believe in God, that's fine. That's your private belief, but don't bring it in public with you. If I don't bring it in public with me, you don't have a limited government. You're gonna lose all those. You're other gonna freedom. lose all the enable rights. So that's the second point. Okay. The third point is very simple. It says that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Now we have the purpose of government. Purpose of government is to protect inalienable rights. Those God-given rights, government exists to protect those God-given rights. Now, significantly, government does not exist to make sure we all have a job or that we've got a great economy. Government exists to make sure that we have a certain set of rights that nobody can violate, nobody can take away. Now, once we've done that, and if you do that, then you will have a prosperous government. You will have a limited government. You will have freedom. And with freedom, we, we take off. I mean, we're gangbusters with freedom. We invent things. We find things. We discover things. We're entrepreneurs. Uh, this 4% of the world population in America boosts more than 96% of the world every year with inventions and, and patents and everything else. I mean, we're more creative because we have more freedom. Because this formula Because that formula out that. there. So you're saying, so, so government is there to protect, not provide. It's there, oh, no, it's there, it's there to pr protect you, and then you go out and earn and produce. If they will keep thieves off my back, I will go and take my ideas. If they will keep somebody from stealing my ideas, I'll go, and I'll, I'll create a McDonald's in every corner. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll create a Walmart in every city. If you'll just keep people from stealing my ideas. And if just that principle was taught today, we wouldn't have government growing so much because we've shifted that now. We think government's job is to provide us with every little need that we and have. And the more it provides, the less prosperous you become because the less initiative you have and the yeah. less creative you are. Government's not creative. It is never creative. Government doesn't discover things. They don't file patents and cures and whatever. Right. You know, they have monopolies if they keep the private citizen from doing it, but they're not the creative source. So yeah. that's the third principle. Okay. Fourth principle says, and to assume among the powers of the earth a separate and equal station which the laws of nature and nature's God entitles them. We'll talk about this more later. But that told every person in that generation that there is a fixed moral law. There are certain laws you cannot cross. And they are called the laws of nature and nature's God. Now, we don't know what that means today, but we'll show you literally the books where the founding fathers took that phrase, what it meant, how they understood it. But there are certain absolute rights and wrongs. We live in a culture today that says, well, if it's right for you, it's right for you, but I don't think yeah. it's right. And no, you can't have a culture that says, you know, well, rape is okay sometimes, but not okay. And, you know, theft is okay if it's for the right reason. You can't be Machiavellian and it justifies the means. You know, rape's okay sometimes, theft's okay sometimes, and, you know, a white lie doesn't hurt anything. No, you got to have fixed rights and wrongs. Perjury is not okay if it's for a good reason. You can't perge yourself under right. oath if it's a little while. No, you have to have fixed absolutes. But if there is no moral them. law, then, then anything then you goes, are. right? If there's no moral law, it becomes anarchy because I will decide what is right and then wrong. Then I get to decide what's right for me. You and if, I have a, if my AR-15 has 30 shots in the mag rather than yours that has 20, I'm more right than you are. Depends on how good of a shot you are. Oh, that's true, but, too. It's true. <laughs> but I get your point. No, that's exactly right. I mean, now there's no fix, like you said. Those John Quincy Adams said, at that point, you have the law of the tiger and the yeah. shark. That's where gangs rule. That's where guys with, with the biggest fists rule. Yeah. That's not what you want. You have to have fixed moral laws that nobody can transgress. You don't cross these laws. The fifth thing you have from the Declaration says, government should sit among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Now, what, what you get with this is what we call the consent of the government or the will of the majority. This is, there is nothing in the Constitution that ever allows anything smaller than a majority to win a vote, unless you're in the U.S. Senate today. And because of the filibuster, 40 beats 60 every time. Founding fathers opposed that. That's why they did not allow filibusters, was the rule of the majority. Now, this is point number five, and it comes only after you've said there are inalienable rights and only after you've said there is a fixed moral law. We don't get to vote on whether rape will or won't be a crime because that's part of the fix, That's part of the laws of nature and nature's God. Yeah. We don't get to vote on, on whether you're going to lose your right to keep and bear arms because that's an inalienable right. The right to defend yourself is a God-given right. God gave it to you, not the government. We can't vote that we're going to take that away from you. So the consent of the government is good when you talk about do we want the sidewalk to be four feet wide or five feet wide or six feet wide? Do we want the speed limit to be 45 or 55? Or if you're in Texas, 85. <laughs> you know, that's what we can do on yeah. the consent of the government. But we cannot vote on inalienable rights or fixed moral laws. That's the principles of the Declaration. And the sixth principle C is... Consent of the government doesn't overrule 
those, those basic right. truths. And, and, and government those exists to protect those nature. truths. Yeah. And, and with those truths, we can have a civilized culture and move forward. We so get it doesn't away from mean we truths. just put our finger to the wind and no. whatever's popular at no. the time changes those fixed points. That's now, not... we can put our finger to the wind on sidewalk size as right. the speed limits, but we can't put our finger to the wind on moral laws and on inalienable yeah, rights. That's a great point. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it's the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and institute new government. It's destructive of what ends? If you get a government that does not do the first five things, if you get a government that says there is no creator, uh, the creator does not give you certain guaranteed rights, government does, we don't exist to protect those rights, and by the way, there is no moral law, there's no rights and wrongs except what we tell you to do, and there's no consent of the government, we will decide what you, if you get a government that won't uphold the first five things, it says it's the right of the people to alter or abolish it, institute a new government. That is the sixth principle of government. We have a lot of changes that have gone on in our constitutional government today, and they didn't happen by the people. The president, by fiat of one pen, decides he's going to change the government. The, the Supreme Court decides, we need to make policy. We don't like that legislative body across it. You cannot have the branches going in and redefining it's their roles. It's violating rules. the first five it's principles. It's violating the first five principles. Yeah. The only way that we get the success, prosperity, freedom, liberty, everything we enjoy is those first five principles. And because government comes from the people, if those first five principles, which are our needs, are not met, then we can start this thing over, or we can pass constitutional amendments, 27 of them. We can change our government, however, but it always comes back to us. You can't have any branch change itself. And the great thing for us, we can actually do that in, in a peaceable means in oh, our yeah. nation. We've been Absolutely. given the tools to alter or abolish We do government. not have to have revolutions to do this. Yeah, or a yeah. revolution with ballots instead of with bullets. See, that's, yeah. that's the revolution we need because at this point in American history, based on, on national statistics, only one out of three Americans vote in presidential elections. Only one out of four vote in non-presidential elections, which means... Uh, since it takes a majority, with one, only one out of three voting presidential elections, that means that half of that one out of three chooses the president, which is about 18 wow. percent, which means five out of six Americans are not choosing the president right now, and seven out of eight Americans are not choosing their governors. But they're living or, with the consequences. They're living with the consequences. Yeah, it's impacting if You want to have a revolution? Show up at the ballot box and say, I've had it. I'm not going to be part of that five out of six that don't vote for my president anymore. I'm yeah. going to vote for my president. Here's what I'm going to get. And when we decide to do that, we can have an easy revolution. So the, the six principles that are very simple here is, one, there's a divine creator. Two, inalienable rights come from God. Three, government exists to protect those rights. Four, there's a fixed moral law. Five, you have the consent of the governed below the moral law and inalienable rights. And six is, if we don't get these five things, we can change it till we do. So that's, that's now the we, six principles. We mentioned where some of this comes from. Back in right. Philadelphia, we talked about that uh, Richard Henry Lee mentioned that uh, John Locke's two treatises of government had a huge impact yeah. on Jefferson. Okay, this is the coolest thing you've ever given me. Actually, I have to admit, you loaned it to me, but possession's nine-tenths of law. <laughs> I've right. had it for about ten years now, so I'm, I'm claiming attorney. it, but You're someday it'll be, go back let, to Let's it. hear you go argue that in court, attorney. <laughs> Come on. All right, this is John Locke's two treatises of government. This is, I believe, a 1784 version or 74 version, if I remember right. So, so this is Locke. That's and, a 1774. Oh, right? you got me beat right there. The, the dueling Locke books. So tell us more about Locke, though, because I hear a lot of people say a lot of negative things about him, and if he was such an influence on the founders, then that means they weren't religious guys, they didn't believe in God. What, what can we One learn of the things Locke? you know for sure about Locke, and political scientists have documented that he was one of the three most frequently cited individuals in the founding era. The founding era goes from 1760 through 1805. In that era where we're establishing and operating our first constitutional government, he's one of the top three guys. Now, so if he, we want to really understand the document itself, mm -hmm. we need to know a little bit about the guys that, a lot he, about the guys that gave it. He is the guy in the 1760s and 1770s. He is the guy quoted most often because that's the age where we did the declaration. Richard Henry Lee, you mentioned, he said that they, quote, copied the, treat, the, copied the declaration from those two treatises of government. Yeah. Now, that's why in American public schools prior to 50 years ago, in government class, you would have read those two treatises really? because that's where the, how can you study government and not know where it came from? Well, you read this. You will not read this today. And as you know, your version there is an inch thick, mine is three quarters an inch thick. They're both less than 400 pages long. Yeah. This book cites the Bible over 1,500 times to show the proper operation of civil government. Now, now let me do the math here. That's got to be, what, three, four times a page? Three, four times a you, page. So you can't go a page without reading the Bible, and yet we're told these guys and, didn't respect and we're, the Bible. We're told they didn't, and we're told John Locke is a great deist, that he was one of the leading deists. You know, yeah. weird thing about Locke as a deist, I wonder why he did this little book right here. This is called The Commonplace Book to the Bible. You open this up, and it's uh, the Scripture's sufficiency practically demonstrated. 
Now, wait a minute, what's a deist doing showing us that the Bible applies to every aspect of life? Yeah, I mean, think of the, it practically demonstrated. So he's saying this is how you use the Bible. This is how you use the in Bible your life. and everything. A deist today alive. would not do that. No way. And, and so he talks to the reader and how applicable this is. And then he goes into here. And what he has done is he's taken all these verses out of the Bible and put them in categories. So the, the duty of a believer with respect to humility. Uh, the duties arising from rel religion relating husband and wife. Uh, duties, religious duties toward God and affliction and persecution. I mean, you take any category and you put the Bible verses together. Why would a deist do that? Yeah, if you thought it was some watchmaker God that steps back and has nothing to do with us, you wouldn't be applying God's Word to your marriage to your and marriage, all these to everything. other things. And, and see, that, that's the thing is because he is the guy who had such a great impact because he had such a big impact and because he is so religious. Oh no, he, he's, he's a deist. You don't need to read his works in government class anymore. So uh, uh, to show you how far we've come in our thinking, even as people of faith, I was recently with a group of about 500 pastors and I said, how many Bible verses can you guys think of that deal with government? Less than 10 in the room. I said, here's a little book right here with more than 1,500. Wow. And he does say it is the scriptures practically demonstrated the sufficiency of the scriptures. Bible applies to it, and the founders knew that. As a matter of fact, that's why if you look at the Declaration of Independence, those rights set forth in the Declaration, historians have documented that every single right set forth in the Declaration of Independence had been preached from the American pulpit prior to 1763. The Declaration of Independence is nothing more than a listen to the sermons we've been hearing so in church. So they weren't, the church was not applying government principles to our life, the church was applying the Bible and that got reflected in, in our government, government principles. principles. So if it was getting taught from the pulpit, it showed up in our government documents. This guy right here, a guy named John Wise. John Wise, um, historians like Clinton Roster, the, and actually Cornell University, he was such a great historian, award-winning historian, that they have an endowed chair of history, the Clinton Roster Chair of History, a great historian. And he went back and said, you know, the American thinking was so different. No other nation did what we did. France didn't do it, Spain didn't do it, Portugal, Italy, no other nation. So he had to be wondering why. why. Why would we do something different? And his question, who, what were the six greatest intellectual forces in shaping the thinking of the founders? He went through and identified six greatest, and four of the six were preachers, and he was one of them. This guy right here, now these are his sermons from 1710 and 1717, and you'll find that by 1680, and he's a preacher in Massachusetts, you'll find by 1680, he had looked through the Bible and he preaches a sermon. Where, well, looking at government in the Bible, it's very clear that God's preferred form of government is the consent of the governed. I think I've heard that phrase before. He looks through here and now he this says, "This was when this was this is 1680s." So this is a hundred years before 1680s, and he's already talking about consent, consent of the, the governed. Okay. And a hundred years before, he says, "You know, there is a creator, and he's created all men equal." And he's given them all the same set of rights. Wow. 16 A's. And, and he goes and he says, when you look at what the Bible says about taxation, it is very clear that taxation without representation is tyranny. No kidding. Right here. So this is, I mean, when we say seeds of liberty, he was literally planting a hundred years before what would bear fruit That's it. Well, in, let, in our founding document. Let me show you how significant this was because he did this in 1680s. Tell me what the date of publication of that is right down there. Oh, I have to read Roman numerals. This is going to be difficult. Okay, so this is, this is 17... 72. Is, that, is it 72? I was 72. going to say 52, so that's 72. Okay, so 17... So the founders then, in their era... You know who the Sons of Liberty are? Yeah. All yeah. right, who are the great Sons of Liberty? So that was uh, Sam Adams started Sam it, Sam right? Adams and John Hancock okay. and James Otis and all those guys' sons... They're the ones who they reprinted this his sermons and distributed across America, so <laughs> Americans would know how to think going into this conference. Okay, so wait, so this, so these are sermons preached a hundred years before the Declaration. The founders themselves reprinted his sermons, mm -hmm. Sons of Liberty, to help educate their generation to get them thinking on, on right principles. So, okay, this gives me great hope because that means if they did it, if they could do this two hundred and whatever years ago, reprint re-educate, bring these things back to light, then we can do the same thing today. Absolutely. We bring these documents out. We That's educate right. a generation. They come back to these principles. We and, bring and, them. And remember that principle number one, and it's demonstrated through here, but principle number one of the Declaration, there is a Creator. And if you don't recognize the Creator, then you've got trouble. Now, this is the other thing we get today. Founding Fathers, atheist, agnostic, deist. It, really? You know, let me, let me take something right here. This is, you tell me, what's the, what's the name at the bottom of this thing? George Washington. George Washington. This is his first ever call to prayer in America at the federal government. That is Washington's... 1789. This is going to be October the 17th, 1789. He calls the entire nation to honor God. Now, why would Washington do that? 
he gives the answer right here in this first paragraph. Let me, let me just put it up. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll show you what's in this first paragraph. Washington is now calling the nation to honor God. Why would he do it? He says, it's the duty. And notice the word duty. Uh, that's a word that is a big important word. We don't talk about it much today. Military yeah. still gets it. A lot of the rural people know what duty means. I built houses for a long time. I, I had hundreds of thousands of dollars change hands. I never signed a contract in my life. I'd walk into the bank guy. We would talk about the terms. We would shake hands on it. Neither one of us would break wow. that contract. That you have a duty to keep your word. Yeah. I don't need it on paper. I've got a duty. And Today so that, you hear duty and people think, oh, responsibility. I, I, well, I don't that's want it. that. Yeah. See, duty in his day is a legally binding contractual obligation. Hmm. In 1913, the, the definition of duty was reduced to a responsibility. And today's dictionary says it's that which one ought to do. So well, that's not the yeah, same. It's as a choice. A sounds like a choice. A choice. Instead of this is what you do. So what he's saying, it's a legally binding contractual obligation of who? Of nations. Legally binding contractual obligations of nations to do four things concerning God. Number one, to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God. Number two, to obey His will. Number three, to be grateful for His benefits. Number four, humbly to implore His protection and favor. And that's what nations are supposed to do, not individuals. So they believe this philosophy that you have to honor and recognize God. as but, a but, but this is just the father of the country. I, yeah. what is, I mean, he's one of the great deist founding fathers, which is what we're told in school today. But he's today. obligating the nation. He's, he's obligating the nation. nation the nation has the nation, the nation yeah. not individuals. The nation has So all this stuff about official acts and, oh, you can keep your religion at home and you can talk about God, but don't even have a you know, public day of prayer. Remember when our, our governor, Rick Perry, couldn't even pray with people in Houston? Yeah, because he got it, together. Because he's governor, he's not allowed to pray with people because it's official. Exactly what we want is official prayer. See that? What's that? Proclamation for Thanksgiving. It's handwritten. It's done by a guy named John Langdon. Oh, he's the governor. Const oh, wait a minute. He's the signer of the Constitution. Constitution, yeah. Yeah, so what do you mean a governor can't have prayer? Here's a governor who's a signer go. of the Constitution. So the signer of the Constitution thought it was the right thing. Y you've also got Samuel Huntington. There there's a signer of the Declaration. He's a call to prayer. He's now governor of his state. He calls the people to so prayer. So this is an official act an official from act. a governor. H here's one from Oliver Wolcott, another signer of the Declaration, another governor of his state calling people to prayer. Um, here's one from John Langdon, governor of the state. Now this is, you know, that was handwritten. This is, this is called a broadside because they would nail these up to trees or they nailed yeah. it up the side of barns. Evidently somebody nailed it up and you see the part missing. And tore it down, look. <laughs> and, and here you've got John Hancock. I mean, here, here's his. I mean, e even behind us, we got all these things behind us. You know, if I, if I go to this one right here, pull this one out. You know, you'll, you'll recognize the guy there. Who's, who's at the bottom? So we're back to the Sons of Liberty. So here's Sam, Sam Adams when he's governor. When he's governor. Okay, now, this, so this kind of ties it together for me. So Adams reprints, he and others reprint John Wise. So there's the principles from a pastor 100 years earlier. Now he's in an official capacity, and he's basically reiterating those exact same principles exactly. from John Wise. And that's the first principle of American government is you have to have something higher than government, and it was God. Yeah. And because God's higher than government, he gives us a certain set of rights to government. You cannot touch those rights. Now we have limited government. And by the way, government, you exist primarily to protect the rights that God told all of us. So we have a right to free speech. We have a right to self-defense. We have a right to sanctity of our home. We have a right to justice. We have a right to trial by jury. Government, you have to protect those rights. It's all, all the things that they listed out as but rights. But if you take the first principle out, all of that falls on. apart. You take mm -hmm. God out. It, it, so these are the seeds of liberty. These and are the seeds of liberty. This is what produced this most incredible nation in the history of the world. So if we go back to the seeds, we can bear That's that right. same fruit that we've had. Once you understand this, now we can talk about the Constitution. Because yeah. now you'll understand the Constitution. All right, well, we're going to step back and get a 30,000 feet view of the Constitution in our next section, kind of a broad overview of the entire Constitution when we return here on Constitutional Live with David Barton and Rick Green.